life out, find your phone sway I'm still trying to get it like every day Humbleness is hard when you start receiving praise God's here but some words can never be taken away Gotta do what's best for you to make life okay Good morning Good morning <laughs> What's San going on? <laughs> Dude, so Big week Had a lot going on We uh, both in the last week became a meme. We became internet, memes. We became internet. memes. And probably a lot of people that are listening to this or watching this saw something around this, but I wanted to talk about it because I thought it was a pretty interesting case study of the new internet and this new age we live in, man. All right, so tell me your meme story. So I'm going through the airport, and by the way, I'm going to preface this by saying this is a true story. So like, I got a lot of flack for this, and everyone was giving me shit saying it, it wasn't true. I'm going to walk you through it. So I'm going through the airport. I'm at John Wayne Airport in LA, going to going flying back home. And it was like a week after I dropped that Evergrande thread, the thing, the Chinese company where you were giving me crap yeah. saying I was the Evergrande guy. So I'm walking through the TSA checkpoint, and the TSA guy is like talking about Evergrande. And I overhear him, and my first reaction is like, oh, I'm going to chime in here. I'm going to come in and say... Yeah, oh yeah, Evergrande, interesting story, interesting situation, whatever. And as I'm about to do that, he says, yeah, I read about, I read about it on Twitter from this guy, Sahil Blue. And I was like, damn, super cool life moment, overheard some guy that had seen about this. Wait, stop there. <laughs> Best part about that is the Sahil Bloom. I thought it was hilarious. It's also how my name is like so commonly mispronounced. Everybody, that's like the first thing that... First way they pronounce it. So anyway, he says it. I grab my bag. I walk away. I don't say anything about it. And then I tweet it out. I, like, there's a cool life moment for me. It's like an interesting thing. And so I tweet it out. And within 30 seconds, it is becoming an internet meme. And I've never experienced that. But like everyone over the course of the next 24 hours is tweeting out like the exact same format tweet with their own thing trolling me. And so it was... Basically, like I'm sitting on a plane and I'm flying back, and my my internet is just blowing up with people like tweeting at me. Most of it was like good fun. Some of it was not, and just like people openly just being mean about it. But it was kind of a wild situation. How like how viral did it get? Pretty fucking viral. I feel like I saw it yeah. everywhere, man. It was everywhere. Yeah. I mean, there were people. I mean, it was it was so viral that there were random people saying it, not citing me as like the original source of it, and then people saying like, oh, this is a really hilarious thing in a hilarious way that people and, were talking And did you feel bad? No, because I knew it was true. Because people were making kind yeah. of making fun of me. Yeah, I mean, you. part of me was just like, I know it's true, so I don't feel bad, and I'm right. just going to wear it, and like, if people want to make fun of me for it, it's fine. But dude, I just leaned into it. I basically said, like, it's fine if people want to make me a meme. I'm going to donate money with it. And so like, I got a bunch of new followers from it, because a lot of people saw my page, and like, Nadama Kong Su, the NFL player who we're going to have on uh, in, a, in an episode in season one, like came and said he would donate money and match me on whatever. So we ended up donating 10 grand to a charity associated with it. Like I said, I would donate a dollar for every new follower I got from becoming a meme. And it was kind of cool. But basically, I had to just lean into it. Because the internet is just permanent, man. You can't like run and hide from stuff the way you might have used to be able to, where you can just say, oh, yeah, I'm just going to delete it, walk away, whatever. And so I leaned into it. Four Sigmatic is the secret sauce behind the Where It Happens podcast. You know how much I've been talking about that hot cocoa, the one that's jam-packed with the reishi mushrooms. It absolutely has been transforming my mornings. I have it at night, completely chills me out, takes out all my stress, and allows me to have a good night's rest. After those long days of tequila on the set, I'm sure that's helpful. I mean, it does help. The sweet vanilla plant-based protein is the one that I've been going to. After my workouts in the mornings, it's been a game changer. 18 grams of plant-based protein, adaptogens, jam-packed with mushroom goodness. It's been a complete game changer for me. So to go check it out, go to foursigmatic.com and use code THEROOM at checkout. Greg, why do you look so tired? I look so tired because I did not sleep last night. Have you never slept well or is this a new thing? It's not that I can't fall asleep. I fall asleep like right away. But I wake up a couple hours later and I'm just sitting in my bed and I look at the ceiling and I can't fall back asleep and I don't know what to do. So I was literally you. And for the longest time, I was this like hustle culture bro, sleep when I'm dead, 
didn't want to sleep, didn't care about my sleep. And then I honestly, I started reading more of the research and realizing how impactful sleep is to your longevity, to your health, all of these other things. And as part of that, I found Eight Sleep, which has completely revolutionized the way I sleep. I've heard of Eight Sleep. Can you tell me more about it? Think of it as like the future of sleep. All of these mattress companies have created these mattresses. They're just stock. They're stock mattresses. Eight Sleep is technology plus sleep combined. So the whole product is built around optimizing the temperature that you sleep at. And so you've read about sleeping cold is the key to sleeping, and it's not quite true. Everyone has a different optimal sleep temperature, and it changes throughout the night, which is the crazy part about it. So you might need really cold to fall asleep, and then you might need it to be a little bit warmer to keep you asleep. And the eight sleep actually transitions your temperature through the night to keep you at the optimal sleep, temp sleep temperature at any point during the night. It keeps you asleep, it helps you fall asleep faster, and I actually, since I started using it, have been sleeping better and feeling so much more energized during the day as a result. Sounds like I need an eight sleep. I think everyone needs an eight sleep. So if you're tuning in right now and you want to try out the eight sleep to completely change the way you sleep, rest, recover, so that you're ready to take on all of life's challenges, check out eightsleep.com slash where it happens to get a discount on your first product. Here's a tip. Don't be like Greg Eisenberg. Be like Sahil Bloom. <laughs> just went with it. There's basically two things you can do, right? You can either lean in yeah. or delete. Yeah. And we have a friend who, yeah. he would totally delete it, right? Yeah. yeah, he was panicked that whole time. He was texting me being like, dude, what are you going to do? This is awful. Your brand is shot. Right. And I don't know, man. I, I just think when, when you have something like that, especially if you can stand behind it, just lean into it. Lean so your life. can you double click into that for a bit? Like, why didn't you decide to delete it? Like, we were just like, it's true. Yeah, I mean, dude, I don't it, care. it was true, and I didn't think the numbers were that ridiculous, by the way. The thread had gotten, like, 7 million impressions. I had gone on TV talking about it, and so I had actually been around talking about it, so I actually didn't think it was that low probability of an inc incident to occur either. And so I was just like, I'm just going to stand behind it. It's real. It is what it is. You want to hear my meme story? Yeah, quick. I'm going right. to start pouring us drinks while you do that. Okay, while you do that, I posted a thread how, you know, I'm just like obsessed with NFTs and Web3 and I'm, I did this thread on yeah. why NFTs are the future. And the first day I, I posted, I'm getting so much love by all these people <laughs> I, I respect. This. Like the top people in like the Web3 community are like just sharing it and, and, and just talking about how it's such a good thread and I'm feeling really good. I go to sleep at night. <laughs> the world is beautiful. I wake up in the morning and I have thousands of replies and retweets and likes on one portion of the thread that is just people memeing it. So I just pulled it up. Um, 30, there's actually 3,800 quote retweets, which is basically just people oh, bad. dunking. <laughs> oh, you wake bad. up and there's 3,800 <laughs> quote retweets. And I was the tweet was, most people who make fun of NFTs don't own, don't own NFTs. They've never minted. I remember this. Yeah. They haven't staked their NFTs. They've never earned an NFT playing a game, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Like, the, the basic idea was that, like, there's a ton of people dunking on, yeah, yeah, on yeah. NFTs. But they're not in the game. They're not in the game. They're not in the game. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, got, I got it. I actually didn't understand why it got memed. Yeah. But you did really become a meme. And yeah. our friend, same friend was freaking out that whole time. I remember that. Yeah, because he was... So, I was everywhere. Yeah. Um, and I, like you, yeah. was like, what do I do? I, I mean, it goes in... It's, it's only natural that it goes into your head. You're like, should I delete this? Yeah. But I'm kind of like, this is what I believe. Yeah. You got to put yourself out there. Yeah. I agree, man. And uh, It's a good segue, too, because our guest today, who yeah. we're going to have in has had his fair share of internet trolls and hate. So he's going to have some interesting perspectives on that as well. Obviously, we've got a little ways that we need to uh, dive into before he comes in, but it'll be fun to talk about with him. Yeah. Let's, so let's get this drink going and dive right into it. Let's do it. Hudson Whiskey, four-part harmony, special edition, man. Hudson? Like Hudson, yeah. New York? Hudson, New York. Okay. Yeah. It's a beautiful bottle. I've never Let's see what we got. I never have you had this? No, I haven't had it. Keep in mind it's nine in the morning right now, so we're really committed to this whole drinking thing. <laughs> oh, it's good. It's, it's sweet. It, it's sweet, right? It's sweet. It's yeah. sweet. It's good. So what are we talking about today? 
I want to talk World's Fair, <laughs> if that works for you. Big World's Fair energy. Uh, I'm into it. I'm into it. So let's talk World's Fair. I want to set the stage for set the stage for this a little bit. Um, so the World's Fair I first read about, I'm curious where you first heard about it. I first read about the World's Fair in the book um, Devil in the White City is the name of the book. Um, Eric Larson, one of my favorite authors actually, is amazing. It's like narrative nonfiction is his, is his archetype. And Devil in the White City is about, really about the first serial killer in history, effectively. And it's a true story, based on a true story, but it's based at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. I think it was called the Columbian Exposition then, but it's, it's the World's Fair. And the whole thing with the World's Fair is like a gathering of the entire world, culturally, industrially, et cetera. You bring people together and share all of the amazing things, progress that's happening. And I think it started in like the late 1700s. I think it was in Bohemia, in Prague, they did the first one. And over the course of history, it's become this big way that basically countries went and flexed on whatever their progress was. And so it was like, you know, early days, you'd go and flex on some industrial progress. Like at, at the 1893 one in Chicago, the Ferris wheel, the first Ferris wheel was like the massive thing. People showed up and there was this enormous circle there that people didn't understand. And you can imagine, like, the first time you see a Ferris wheel, that's bananas right. to go and see that. And go and you're going to get into a thing that's going around this 200-foot <laughs> circle. That seems ridiculous. And so people would use it, these countries would use it to flex on their progress. And it was people, and it was also countries, and it was, it was like a romantic aspect to it. You would go, and there was people from different cultures, and they would do dances, and it was like this amazing, amazing thing. And for a lot of history, it was like the one time per each year, every few years, where the world would actually come together. It was like an intellectual Olympics, like cultural intellectual Olympics, sort of. Rather than being sports, it was people coming together. Okay. So, you know about this guy, because we've talked about this, but there is someone out there today who is pitching the idea of bringing back the World's Fair. Basically... Making a new World's Fair, right? Yeah. Because doesn't the World's Fair already exist? Like, it, it still happens. There was one yes. in Dubai recently, I Right think. now. Oh, right, right now? now. So, so Dubai was supposed to have the 2020 World Expo, I think they were calling it. It was this massive thing. COVID obviously got in the way of that. Right. So now they're doing... I think it's it's still called 2020 World Expo, but it's Dubai 20, 2021 through 2022. But the whole idea is like six months extravaganza. People come in. It's this huge economic boon, et cetera. So we recently got pitched on um, the idea of the new World's Fair, bringing it back, bring back the World's Fair, go and do it bigger, better than it's ever been before. And I want to talk about it because I think it's interesting. Okay, so let's talk about it. Okay. Hit me. What do you think? I mean, so I've known about the World's Fair my whole life because growing up in Montreal, the World's Fair, it was called Expo 67, yep. is, was a big deal. And I actually... The Montreal Expos, by the way, the baseball team, a baseball guy, so I got to say it, Montreal Expos named after... Expo, whatever. 67. They, yeah, 67. Yeah. That's how they got their name. So everyone in Fun the city, fact. everyone in the city knows about, you know, how important the expo is. Yeah. Where you can go out on the street and just be like, what is the World's Fair? What is an expo? And people will tell you. Is that like the moon landing for Canadians? It's like everyone knows where they were when the moon landing happened in the U.S. Is that like, where were you when 67 Expo happened? Pretty, pretty much. Huh. So... Recently, I actually went to, I don't know if I told you this, but I went to a hotel in Montreal, and it was World's Fair themed. Hmm. And you walked into this hotel, and everything, like all the walls had like things about the World's Fair. All the rooms uh, like were, were unique and different, yeah. and they all had like, you were maybe in like the Chinese room, or the Japanese room, yeah. or different, all that sort of thing. And you put on the TV, and there's like, you know, you don't get, like, CNN or, or yeah. CBS. You get, like, videos, old-school videos of huh. the World's Fair. Yeah. And I actually learned about, like, I watched this, like, I turned on the TV, and I watched the making of the World's Fair, and it was this, in Montreal, and there's this beautiful moment where, I think, like, in 1963, they were like, we want to do this World's Fair, um, and they built an island in four, in four years, and they did the impossible. And it's a story about how they did the impossible and how all of Canada came together to make it happen. Yeah. It's this, like, beautiful story. And it's very romantic. 
It's very romantic. And yeah. I think like the more that's that's the common thread of all of um, expo stories yeah. or, or world fair stories is that it's the coming it's the coming together of people and it's the showcasing of these different cultures. Yeah. And there's a lot of nostalgia for that. Yeah. So on one hand, I love the idea around like showcasing cultures, promoting other cultures, bringing people together, experiential stuff. Like I think there's a huge business opportunity there. Like yeah. I'm sure you've seen like Museum of Ice Cream and stuff like that, um, but on a bigger sc scale. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, like, isn't the internet that? Like, isn't the internet where you, like, go and, like, yeah. showcase stuff? Like, if I'm coming out with a new product, I don't, like, I don't need to showcase it at, like, a physical event. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's so, kind of the bearish case for this. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts here. So, basically, look, I, I think this is either, there's something I really like about it. I love the aspect of nostalgia. I love the aspect of bringing people together. I think the cultural blending, I think it's amazing. And a lot of cool things happen when you bring a lot of people together. Cool businesses, business ideas get formed. There's intermingling of thoughts. I mean, amazing things can happen at something like this. But it's got big fire festival vibes too. Mm -hmm. Like this, this whole idea feels a little bit like, okay, we're bringing 50 million people together. We're going to, you know, it's like, Events are not easy to do. I, don't, I mean, I know a lot of people who try to do events. Our guest today has one of the most successful event businesses in the world. I mean, it's really hard to do. There's a lot of little nuances to doing something like this. It's not just like, oh, yeah, slap an idea on a page. We're going to go create this massive event. 50 million people are going to come. We're going to make $20 billion in the first run. And to give him credit, I mean, this guy is clearly selling a really cool story and vision and ambition. And it is romantic and it brings up nostalgia. He's raised a bunch of money. There's real people that are coming onto it. So I'm either like in love with the idea and I want to just be a part of it because I think it's going to be really cool. Or I think it's just like the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. There's no middle ground for me on this and I don't know where I'm landing on it. I think like what's smart about what he's doing is like, he he picked a business idea or startup idea that like is cult like there's a lot of connection culturally. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he's not and in those types of businesses you can raise tons of money because like you're pitching, let's say people like me, like, you know, I brought this this is an ashtray. What is that? It's an ashtray from the <laughs> Expo World's Fair in nineteen sixty seven wow. in Montreal. And like People like me, I, I you know, get pitched on it, and it's like, yeah, like, it's cool. you know, maybe I would invest. Maybe I want to see a new World Fair, you know? And I yeah. think, like, um, there's... What do you, like, from an actual business standpoint, starting and running something like this is insanely complicated. It's, it's not like... It, a lot of the business ideas we talk about here and some of the things we've talked about in our first shows, you could go spin up in a weekend, like an right. MVP for this. There's no doing a 50 million person event, yeah. I mean, even if it's one tenth of that, a five million person event, is a ridiculous undertaking. <clears throat> and it needs to involve governments, it needs right. to involve all the municipalities. Like, if you're going to do all these pavilions, there's all the building involved. I mean, there's like a crazy, crazy um, bunch of coordination that has to happen in order to make this work. And so, like, that's the part where I just, like, I guess I can't understand the idea because it's so hard to actually execute something like this at a grand scale and in a good way. I mean, like Billy McFarland, right? Right. Great. Fire Festival was a great idea. I would give him credit for it. He's a like, fraudster and uh, you know, did a lot of things that are really bad. But the idea of it, if he had executed, it would have been dope. Here's what I would do if I was the, world, the new World's Fair guy. Go for it. So I wouldn't raise a lot of money mm -hmm. and like, go and build a bunch of events from the get-go. I would think about how can I build it, like how can I do community first, internet first, mm. validate the demand, mm. and then build events. Because mm -hmm. like right now what he's going to do is like he's going to have to go work with cities, he's going to have to get space, he's going to have to like get vendors, he's going to have to coordinate. It's a lot of stuff. Yeah. I would, you know, if I was him, I would kind of just build, you know, start with Discord, start with Facebook groups, start, you know, start yeah. with like no code solutions, build it out, build the demand, and then go to like the city of yeah. you know Miami and be like, hey, I have a million people yeah. who are interested in this thing, and there's like a lot of like real digital activity. Mm -hmm. Let's translate that into yeah. 
like the physical. I like this a lot, the way you're thinking about it. It reminds me, do you, have I ever talked to you about the, um, the mental model, like the map is not the territory? Have no. I ever talked to you about this? No. So this is this whole idea that you are <clears throat> fu fundamentally, the map is supposed to be a representation of the territory that you're looking at. And the more you abstract the territory into a map, the worse it is, like the lower fidelity the map is. And so if you have you know, a massive stretch of land and you're trying to create it into like this tiny map, it's gonna be a pretty crappy map because you're trying to boil down this massive piece of territory that's very complicated into something very simple. We all create maps, like maps are mental models. You're going around the world, you're trying to create different maps of everything you're looking at. And the challenge is when you're using a map that actually doesn't match the thing that you're going and trying to create and do. And I think this is a perfect example of where that can come into play, which is basically to say he has created a map based on what the World's Fair is. And it's based on what the past looked like. So what World's Fairs looked like in 1893, the Devil in the White City in Chicago, this amazing hundreds of pavilions, etc. cetera. Um, and he's using that to play out how you should pursue and build everything. When the reality of what you're hitting on is that maybe the World's Fair of 2025, 20, 2030 20, looks a whole lot different than what it looked like in the past. I mean, maybe, cert like, certainly. Certainly, yeah. yeah. A and the pursuit of building it looks a lot different than what it would have looked like in 1893 or in 1950 or whatever year it was. Maybe it doesn't have to be, like, physical at all, to your right. point. Maybe you end up building a digital World's Fair where people can come together. Because how many people, the thing that I push back on with all of this is there aren't that many people that are going to be able to or have the means to travel to these things. And in a digital world, one of the most exciting trends that's happening is that we're breaking down the barriers to anybody having access to these amazing cultural and intellectual experiences and learning experiences. And so if you could build a World's Fair, like if his idea um, can become the genesis of either him or someone else building something really unique that becomes like a hybrid physical digital world's fair like experience that's pretty darn cool to me i think he he hit on a really smart insight yeah. around like people want to connect countries want to show off their yeah. you know their stuff and i think that there probably is space for something like this yeah. but i think what we're saying, it sounds like what we're saying is maybe like the entry point yeah. is kind of a bit of a miss. Yeah. And and maybe he's changed and like maybe he's yeah. maybe he's he's going digital first. I mean, I love the ambition. I, 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 love, I, the ambition. I, I love the vibe that he's putting up. Let's talk raising about, money for let's it. Let's talk about things we love about this and things we hate about. Yeah. It. So things things we love. You know, what do you got? I love the ambition. I think it's a huge idea, which I think is really cool. And if you're going to go build something, you might as well build something big. I think I could think like Steve Schwartzman, the Blackstone guy, talks about that, where like it's just as much effort to start something small as it is to start something big, so you might as well go big. And this guy is clearly going pretty big as he right. thinks about the idea, and I love that. Can I just edit that for a second? Okay. So I, I totally agree with that sentiment, but... You don't need it. Your, your your MVP doesn't need to go big. Yeah, right? that's your true. Minimal viable product doesn't that's need true. to go big. Your vision could go big, go big, but the entry point yeah. needs to be covert. It yeah. needs to be tactical. It needs to be super smart. It yeah. needs to be intentional. And you need to test along the way. To your point, yeah. like I just don't know if there's 50 million people that would want to go to a world's fair today. Right. I, so I don't know. Bearish, is that your kind of bearish? Hat, like, no, I, my bearish hat is you just can't do it. Right. <laughs> it's just so hard. I just think there's so many nuances to doing an event business. I mean, we, we like again, we'll we'll talk to our guest when he comes in and talk about the nuances of running a an event business. But there's just a lot that has to get coordinated around it. And when you're talking about on the scale that he's talking about, you have to involve national governments, municipal governments. I mean, it's everybody. It's insane. What What do you think happens to this business in 15 years? What's your What's your prediction? My prediction would be it gets boiled down to something more manageable and doable. And that, like, I, I think his ambition and his energy is amazing. And I never like to bet against people that have good energy. So I would guess he ends up getting something spun up that works. Yeah, that's, that's, <clears throat> that's my vibe with it, too, is it's rare you meet people who have, like, that ambition, passion, yeah. and, like, I think it, he was ra able to raise a lot. Yeah. Um, it's not a venture bet. Like, I just, I don't understand it as a venture investment, though. I really don't. I just am, like, I don't know, what, what's the valuation of a... Right. I mean, he's pitching it, like, it's $20 billion revenue. I don't know. Like, Dubai World Expo is supposed to generate... I saw some projection this morning when I was looking this up, like, $20 billion for the Dubai 
government. Yeah. It's just, I like, how can that possibly, how can you project anything out? I think my prediction is he zigs and he zags. Yeah. And he, you know, he kind of Trojan horses his way in. Yeah. And he makes something happen. Yeah. He seems like the type of guy that can do some zigging right? and zagging and make it work, man. And, and like, I, and I'm all for that. I love people that do this kind of stuff. So I, I feel like we're at a good spot on it. I want to bring in our guest and get his perspectives because he's actually built event businesses and he's right. actually done the nuances and the details of trying to build something like this out and he'll have a lot more interesting and informed perspectives than we will on it. So Anthony has a really long career. He's done a bunch of stuff. He was the founder of Skybridge, which is one of the most successful fund of funds in the world, has done a lot in crypto recently, as you know, very, yep. very cool. Um, also the founder of SALT, which is one of the biggest conferences in the world, within the financial world in particular, has been very successful. But as we all know, he's most well known for his 10-day stint as White House head of communications under the Trump administration, was famously forced out of that position and has been an uh, active critic of, of uh, our former president since then. So really excited to have him in. He's very opinionated and a lot of fun to be around, as both of us know. Uh, so very excited to welcome into the room where it happens our friend Anthony Scaramucci, the Mooch. Do you mind being called the Mooch? You can call me the Mooch. Let's you like that? I mean, Cheers. Just yeah, so right. everybody knows, Cheers. it's 7 a.m. These yeah, guys are already yeah. drinking. Yeah. Okay? We're degenerates around so here. That's what, we're, that's what we're known for. So. so we were talking before you came in about the World's Fair. And there's a young man, I don't know if he's even a young man, he's probably 30, going around raising millions of dollars right now to try to bring back and rebuild the World's Fair. But you've actually done this shit. Like you've gone, you built SALT, one of the most successful financial conferences, conferences in general in the world, and Thank you, you built it from the ground up. Can you just talk about, like, is this ridiculous? Is it possible? What do you think? Well, your generation is your age, I'm assuming, or mm -hmm. younger. I would never doubt anybody in your generation. I think you guys have uh, balls, courage, conviction. Uh, you're more mature than my generation. I think we had more fun, by the way. I, I like being <laughs> the oldest person in the room because I walk in, I'm like, Okay, I definitely had more fun than these guys in college because you're not allowed to talk to people anymore. <laughs> Everything's politically correct. You could end up getting canceled for saying something stupid. That didn't happen to us, okay? We were all reckless and totally fine, and there was no social media, so there was no record of me being an idiot. It just happened to be a full-on idiot. So, When was um, that, the 80s? Yeah, that was in the 80s, yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's not go too far. It <laughs> right, exactly. It was the 60s, <laughs> bloom. Okay, but, but here's what I would say. Um, a project like that, is probably different from a conference, right? Because now yeah. you're talking about global exhibition and you're talking about figuring out a way to get at least the 15 or 20 industrial nations involved. And so you're creating a mini Epcot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that is a massive undertaking. Having said that, if he can raise some money and he can get the ball rolling, and if he's smart enough to do what somebody like a Jeff Bezos did, which is delegate, farm out, create a uh, collaboration with a group of people, it's not impossible, yeah. and you could probably get it done. The number, the number one thing I tell people is you can't do everything yourself. But if you got a team, you got a great, really good group of people, and you're willing to collaborate, you can get unbelievable amounts done. And in my organizations that I've run, people work with me, they don't work for me. See the distinction? It's very important. Yeah. Because if you're working with me, you're now empowered, you're my partner, we're collaborating. If you're working for me and you have that ordinance structure, it can be limiting and then sometimes it could be suffocating. So I don't know the guy, um, but he could be he could be onto something. He could pull it off. You want to talk to him? You want to invest? Uh, I no, I don't want to invest, but I would definitely <laughs> talk to him. I like mentoring people. Yeah. You know? What advice would you give him? You know, he's just starting out. He's raised a bit of money. He's got you know great ambitions. Oh, look, I mean, they've done the World's Fair in a lot of places. They did it in Knoxville. They did it in Seattle. The Have one, you ever been to one? The one that I went to in 1964, I just might add, I was in the stroller. We right. around <laughs> by my mom and dad, okay, out here in Queens. Those people are probably, you know, long gone in terms of those planners. But I would go to the most recent ones, yeah. and I would identify people that have planned this thing before and get them in the loop. You know, we were talking about the Saul Conference. I'll take you back to 2009. Every major investment bank was leaving Las Vegas because of the TARP money. And so what was that? The government gave all the banks money uh, yeah. to help defend their balance sheets during the crisis. 
And so they all felt compelled to cancel any highfalutin conferences because they didn't want to be seen spending the government's money in a place like Las Vegas. And right. I think President Obama he didn't do it on purpose, but he was like, hey, now's not the time to go to Las Vegas. And so all these guys canceled. And here I am as a small time entrepreneur seeing that opportunity. So I go, wait a minute. You know, we shouldn't be giving up all of our conferences. I'm a smaller company. I didn't receive TARP money. I'm going to put a stake in the ground and fill that vacuum. Mm. But I couldn't do it on my own. So I called the mayor of Las Vegas. I called Steve Wynn. I, uh, you know, went to people that have built conferences before. Michael Milken mm. was my first keynote speaker. Oh, wow. And so I would tell him, you got to think like that. You've got you got a great idea, but you're not going to be able to do everything. Mm find people that can help you do the things that you need to do. What do you think? I mean, you built something incredible with Salt. You just ran, I know, your most recent one. It was in person, which was a huge um, thing for New York to bring that back and do something in person. I know people were really excited about it. It was a great event, by the way. I really enjoyed thank, it. Thank you. Um, what do you think the future of these events looks like post-COVID? Do you think it's going to come back and all be in person, or do you think it's going to be some kind of digital hybrid experience? Well, I think it's coming back. I think we need each other, and I think mm -hmm. we need the physicality. We're a social organization, uh, social organism, if you will. And I also think that one of our problems is that we're, we're always tied into a screen. And so we're always here, and we're interacting with each other here or over Zoom. Mm -hmm. And so we're losing that physical connection. So I actually think the conferences are going to be bigger <laughs> and weirdly better because it's like a concentrated dose of human personal contact. So um, in the case of our conference, we did it at the Javits Center. We ran those air conditioners and those HEPA filters yep. over time. We paid the money to do that. Very high ceiling. Scott Gottlieb, a friend of mine, who was the former FDA commissioner, came in and gave me a safety protocol, which we followed. We had a vaccine mandate, which I feel very, very strongly about. Mm and a result of which we had little to no breakthrough COVID. Uh, and people could wear masks or not wear masks because that was the health guidance. And of course we had big outdoor spaces for networking. So it worked, I think people were happy. You were there. And yeah, it was great. People enjoyed awesome it. Awesome event. And so I think we're going back to that. And I think as we start to normalize and this pandemic becomes an endemic situation, which is treatable. I had uh, the opportunity to go to the Damon Runyon Cancer Research Foundation breakfast this morning. Ken Frazier was being honored, the former oh, wow. CEO of Merck. And we had a chance to connect before the breakfast talking about these vi antiviral therapies that are coming. Uh, it's going to be very promising for us. You know, yeah. That's why the future is always bright. There's people like you guys that are going to be running the future. But you don't want to think linearly about our society. You can get very pessimistic. You want to think exponentially about our society. Uh, and that's where you get very optimistic yeah. about technology and that things leads, that we can do to solve our problems. It leads to something really interesting, because one of the things I've been most impressed about you as I've learned more about you and as we've gotten to know each other and become friends is you're someone that's come from a different generation. You've built in multiple generations, different businesses, and yet you've been such a massive proponent recently, especially of cryptocurrencies and of Bitcoin and of Web3, and you're supporting it, investing in it with SkyBridge and doing all these other things. How did that happen? Like, where, where, where did you come from on that? And what got you so excited about the exponential potential? So I have kids your ages. Yeah. Okay? They are pains in the ass, I will tell you that. Okay? But I'm not a pain in the ass. It, 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 well, yeah, okay. I don't know you well enough. Yeah. I'll, I'll judge that after the exactly. podcast is over whether I think you're a pain in the ass. But, <laughs> but here's, what, here's what happens. You have to make a generational decision. So I can remember my parents thinking that we were – naive, large generation gap, they couldn't learn anything from me. And by the way, I couldn't learn anything from them. And I think that is a very big mistake that generations make. You know, you guys are in the future and you guys are doing things that I have not experienced. You know, when you got to college, there were computers. You know, when I was in college, believe it or not, there were no computers. We had a mainframe, you had to sign up for it. And I had to go and wait to get on a terminal that was hooked into a digital equipment mainframe. And so if I was typing up a report, I had to send it to the mainframe, and then someone would print it out for me the next day. Okay, that, that's how I grew up. I used to frame of reference. So, um, but I have life experience. I've been through market cycles. I think people your age could learn from me 
in terms of that perspective. You know, Bitcoin is at an all-time high this morning as we're speaking, but it could crash by 50%. How do you weather those storms? How do you think about it? So I think my generation can offer that perspective. So I want you guys to be open-minded to listen to that. But the flip side, I've got to listen to you guys. I got to listen to what you're working on, whether it's programmable biology, the blockchain, cryptocurrency, uh, things that could be related to the ecology of the planet. Uh, we both, all three of us know that the planet is not doing well. Uh, if you look at the diagnostics of the planet, the carbon admission, the fires, the pollution in some of the big cities like Beijing is an example. We, we, we don't need to be debating whether or not we're hurting the planet anymore, I don't think. I think we've litigated that. We're hurting the planet. We have to figure out how to solve for that. And so your generation, I think, is going to come up with those ideas, those innovations. I've got to be listening to that. And so, you know, what's interesting about my son, AJ, went to Stanford Business School, yeah. bright kid running a venture fund. He's a crypto skeptic. Hmm. He's not the crypto bull. Hmm. Okay. One of his partners happens to be a crypto bull. Uh, but what got me into it is speaking with guys like Anthony Pompliano, uh -huh. uh, taking the time to understand it. Uh, one of my intellectual men me mentors is a guy named Charlie Munger. Who's yeah. that? He's 97 years Heard old. Heard of him. He says that Bitcoin is the worst thing that's ever happened. To this. <laughs> Rat I mean, poison we, square. We've had Holocaust, we've had Bitcoin. earthquakes, but Bitcoin, <laughs> we've had a lot of bombs go off, but Bitcoin's the yeah. worst thing that's happened to civilization. And it's surprising <laughs> to me because when you learn about his life, he was a lawyer, went to Harvard Law School, uh, looked up to him, I still look up to him. But what did he say? Know the other side of the argument better than your own argument. And so I have found that anybody that studies the blockchain, studies Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, uh, a guy like Ray Dalio, a uh, brilliant guy, a Bitcoin skeptic, studies it, he buys Bitcoin. Paul Tudor Jones, a skeptic, studies it, buys Bitcoin. Uh, and I can, I can name yeah. 10 or 12 of these list. people. So once I started to understand it, I said, okay, well, wait a minute. This is a technological delayering mechanism for our society. We can take the middle men, the middle women out of our transactions, and we can start transacting peer to peer. Mm. And it has unbelievable long-term ramifications. The blockchain is going to allow us to trust each other without knowing each other. We don't have to go through a JP Morgan or you pick a firm, a Wells Fargo, whoever. We can go to each other over the blockchain. I want you to think about the eco friendliness of that, the efficiencies that that will create, and it'll free us up to do other things in a society. So so for me, once I got that, once I understood mm. it, and I had this conversation with Michael Saylor yesterday, he's become a very good friend of mine, is I'm like, okay, I'm not long enough. Okay, how do I get more long this? And then, of course, I'm dealing with my generation, which are poo-pooing it, mm -hmm. uh, and they're all institutionalists, and they don't want to be embarrassed by being wrong. As you guys know, I've been fired from the White House. I got fired from Goldman Sachs. <laughs> I've been torched in business. I don't mind being wrong, okay? I'm like mm -hmm. a human crash dummy. I have no problem being wrong. And what I would encourage your generation to do is take risks, mm -hmm. hit the pavement, and be a Super Bowl. You don't want to be Super Bowl. Bone China, okay? You don't like want to be the guy that went to Stanford. It's like, oh, my God, I went to Stanford, so therefore I can't fail. Mm -hmm. I've got to do everything perfectly, and i got to please mm -hmm. my parents, and... I have my career arc's got to be a 45 degree angle. Take risks. Love that. Be willing to fail. Uh -huh. Because if you're willing to fail, then you can get exposure to Bitcoin. I've got buddies of mine that are like, man, I, I hear what you're saying, but I can't be embarrassed if I'm wrong. Well, what do you mean? Well, if I put 3% of my portfolio in Bitcoin at $8,000 a coin and it goes to zero, now I've embarrassed myself. I got huckstered and it was a con. Uh, uh, but I'm not that guy. I, I'm willing to take that risk uh, because I see what you guys see in the future. Yeah. And I think we're all going to be right about it. And, and, but even if I'm wrong about it, I have it sized in my portfolio from an allocation perspective where I think it's going to be fine. And, and I have to deal with now clients of mine yeah. that hate Bitcoin. So I created a ETF called Crypt, CRPT. It's got unbelievable correlation to Bitcoin, but it's in Coinbase, right, MicroStrategies. Right, right. Marathon Digital, Smart. you see what I mean? So yeah. now I can go to my fuddy-duddies, these old farts yeah, that I have to yeah, deal yeah, with, yeah. and say, yeah. okay, you don't want to buy the Bitcoin, but 
How about these companies that are growing yeah. at fifty percent a year? It's equivocating. It's good. It's smart. Yeah, yeah you have to be like flexible. It. Be flexible. You, Neurally the, plastic. You hit on something. I mean, the the Super Bowl thing. I've never heard it referenced that way, and I think it's amazing. You, you're someone who you've learned how to take a punch really, really well and pivot, yeah, got gather lot, yourself, got a lot of practice, and throw the a next lot of times. one. I, but like. There's something amazing in that, and it's probably one of the biggest signals of someone that's going to be successful is the ability to take a punch, gather yourself, pivot, and still fight back after that. Well, what taught you that? Like, what, what, you know, you know, what in I, your life? You know, remember, I, I grew up in a blue-collar family, okay? I, I, you know, my father didn't give me a lot of advice because he was wearing a green uniform when he went to work. Uh, he was loaded with grease when he came home. And uh, he, got, he got up at 4.30 in the morning. I can remember my mother putting his lunch pail in the refrigerator at 9.30 at night. He came home at 3.30. I mean, God forbid you weren't at that dinner table. At 5.15, you got your ass kicked by him. Mm -hmm. And But if you were in sports, then it was okay. But if you weren't in sports, you had to be sitting at the table with him. And he was a hard guy. He was a very honest guy. Uh, and he couldn't give me a lot of advice. But he said to me something that I'll share with you and you should think about. When I got my job at Goldman, okay, so I, I graduated from Harvard Law School. My parents think it's Hartford Law School. I mean, they have no idea. Okay? They, they, they're like, they want to take me to Hartford. Connecticut. I'm like, Mom, it's Har Harvard Law School. Why the hell would they call it Hartford Law School if it's not in Hartford? <laughs> because it's not called Hartford Law School, right? It's like an Everybody Loves Raymond sitcom, right? Right. So I'm coming out of school. I got my job at Goldman. I'm buying myself some suits. And my father says to me, I want you to never complain about your job. And I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, just remember something about your job. You're indoors, mm. you're out of direct sunlight, and there's no heavy lifting. Okay, I just want you to think about that for a second. My dad spent 42 years on a crane, hot and cold weather, uh, working the crane. Crane broke down. You got to get out of the cabin, fix the crane. He did that for 42 years. And so here I am, blessed with this opportunity to wear a suit. You guys dress like shit, by the way. We'll talk about that on our fashion podcast. Okay? I can't believe the way you're you launching a, a fashion I can't believe podcast? the way your generation dresses. It's like unbelievable to me, but that's fine. These are the billionaires of the today's podcast. I'm the pauper, but it's fine. But I just want you to think about that. So my expectations were here. Okay, so when you get hit and you watch your father get up in the morning at 3.30, you're like, okay, this is no big deal. Okay, he's got five big fucking deal. Let me dust off and get back to work. Oh, I'm getting fired from Goldman? Okay, fine. Let me go find another job. Turns out I found a job at Goldman. Right? So this is another funny part of my life. They gave me an $11,000 severance check. They fired me on February 1st, 1991. I'm looking for a job. I get a job offer back at Goldman. The <laughs> personnel director, she's a lovely person. She's like, Can, we're going to mark you down as interdepartmental transfer. You'll never have to tell anybody you got fired. Can we get the $11,000 check back? I'm like, no way. I need the money. I mean, I'm paying off school debt. I said, you can tell the whole planet I got fired. I don't give a shit. You see what I'm saying? I mean, why would Absolutely. you give a shit, right? So now I'm back at Goldman working, and I realize that I got to start my own business because I don't fit into their culture. I don't have the right personality. And that's another big lesson for your listeners is don't conform. You don't want to be a conformist, okay, because your life will suck. Every day will be dread. And every day will be work. And so you got to figure out who you are and be who you are and be comfortable in your own skin. And so I realized that I couldn't be there. And so I wrote down in my book, if I can pay off my school debt the day after I'm leaving Goldman Sachs to create my own business. So I paid my debt off in May of 1996 at the age of 32. I left Goldman Sachs on December 1st at the end of their fiscal hmm. year. So low expectations, accept failure, be willing to pivot. You got to have a sense of humor. When you're getting your ass fired from the White House and they're lighting you up on Saturday Night Live and you run into Lorne Michaels at the Met Yankee game, you know, you say, hey, a little more hairspray, please. Okay, the tie wasn't tight enough, right? <laughs> what are you going to do? You got to roll. That's the exact it. thing we were talking about at the beginning of the show. You got to lean into it. Like stuff happens in your life, you get embarrassed. Stuff Even happens. Colbert Just lean asked into me, he said, Do you think you're going to last a long time yeah. in the White House? I said, Longer than a carton of milk in the refrigerator. I didn't think it was going to get blown out like that. <laughs> Do you, okay, think, but, you think our generation but, you know, is softer? Like no, I, I think your generation is self-conscious. I don't, mm, not mm. softer. No, you got very tough. Remember, I've been on troop support missions to Iraq and Afghanistan. You got some killers in your generation. I don't, I don't think they're softer. There's a layer of your generation that might be a little entitled where mm -hmm. they have high expectations. 
um, but there's self-consciousness that you have to do away with. So in other words, I'm going to start this company. I'm going to go to the cocktail party. I got to be able to brag about the success of the company and I've got everything figured out. I got to tell everybody that. That I think is a weakness. That's not a strength. The strength is telling people authentically what's going on in your life because the minute you can turn to that and you can express your vulnerability, people start trusting you. They say, well, how are you doing? And you tell them, well, look, this is how I'm doing. You know, we just had a setback here. I tried to launch the website. It blew up. And all of a sudden, someone will look at you and say, this is a real guy. You know, because everybody's dealing with that. Everybody's got problems. And when you're trying to gloss over your situation or paint a perfect picture, to me, that's a sign of insecurity. Uh-huh. So, no, I think you got very tough people in your generation. I'm very impressed with your generation. I have high hopes for your generation that, frankly, are going to solve a lot of the problems that my generation caused. You know, we were nihilists, smoking pot, they're going to Woodstock, they're buying BMWs. People are still and, smoking pot. Of course they are, but I'm saying they're, they're, going, they're going to Woodstock, then they're driving around in BMWs with right. yellow ties in the 80s, <laughs> and they're peeing on each other in the politics, you know. You, you know, it's not enough for me to be 100% right. I have to beat your brains in on cable television. And that's hurting the country. We have to figure out a way to focus not on left or right, but what's right or wrong. Right? That's why I like reading your stuff, because you're looking at it from a heuristic perspective. You're looking at it from a clinical perspective. What's going to make somebody successful? What's going to make a kid motivated to read and write? Uh, let's focus on things like that. Let's not focus on the politics and the unions and all this stuff. How do we get a kid and give him a platform of equal opportunity? I'm all about unequal outcomes. I want you guys to both shoot yourselves into space in your own rockets, okay, like Bezos. God bless. If you can create public good and make that level of public profit and you want to shoot yourself into space in a rocket, you know, go for it. Bring Captain Kirk with you, okay? But... But we have to have equal opportunity. You know, we have to have a platform of equal opportunity. So if I'm born in Harlem or if I'm born in an inner city and you know, maybe my parents haven't figured it out, is there something in our society that can help me figure it out? I grew up with a modest amount of money in a middle class environment, but they were strong people and they were hitting me to go study and they, they wanted us to go to college. They didn't know what fucking college it was, but they wanted us to go. Okay. And we have to do that for our, our young people. And you guys are going to figure that out. I have high hopes. You guys, this tech, these technologies are going to allow for brilliant educators to enter everybody's classroom if our politics and our policies and how we deal with unions and all this other stuff allow that to happen. And that would be transformative. It would be very good. Yeah, I think that's what, I mean, if I were to have a takeaway from it, I think that's what... I find so exciting about Web3 and about cryptocurrencies is that it's not the rich kid that grew up and went to Goldman and you know has been an MD at Goldman for the last 20 years that's getting rich off this. It's anybody. I mean, there's a massive generational transfer of wealth that's happening right now, and the incumbents don't like it. Insiders don't love the fact that anybody can get onto these on-rails and operate in this system. But it's such a cool thing. Some some of the incumbents. Yeah. You know, some I would of the incumbents. I would say, I would say all of them. You know, listen, I, I love it. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm a product of a blue collar family. That's true. I want people, but you're a little different. I want the society to be flatter. I want I want good things. You know, I was with. Uh, you didn't grow up in a country club culture, though, going and playing no, golf I mean, on the weekends. You know, You've I mean, made yourself my, into what you are. That's one of my best stories. Now, we make ourselves into what we are. You never do it on your own. Trust sure. me. You need uh-huh. mentors and professors, sure. yeah. and you need yeah. uh, parents, and you need siblings. When somebody tells me they're self made, I did it all on my own, I'm like, okay, not possible. Yeah, not, possible. not in our society, right? But I'll tell you guys a funny story. I'm at the Charles Hotel. Boston? Uh, in Boston. Uh-huh. Uh, the Goldman Sachs has set up an interview room. And I walk in there, and this is the 80s. I'm in 100% polyester. Okay? I, got a, I got a polyester black suit. Okay, I'm like a young funeral director. I'm setting the scene. Okay? I got a polyester shirt. Okay, I'm literally glowing. I mean, this shit can come out of the dryer. You don't even have to even bring it to the dry cleaner. Right? I got a black Guido tie. And I'm wearing these Capizio dance shoes. We used to call them cockroach killers because they had points on them. <laughs> you could kill cockroaches in the corners, okay? And I got them laced up. My hair's blown back, but like Tony Monero from Saturday Night Live. And I'm in the interview, and there's two guys sitting there, like you guys are, and they're asking me 
questions about the TED spread and the Euro swap and the petrodollar, and I'm hitting every question. And and got, and, and then one guy gets up. He says, "Can I can I see you for a sec?" I said, "Yeah." He goes, he goes "Man, I got to tell you, you're a smart kid. You were the worst dressed person that we've ever met at the Harvard <laughs> Law School. What are you doing in this outfit?" <laughs> and I looked at him like I thought I looked great. I mean, I had no idea. Okay, and I he says, well, "This is my best clothing." He said, "Okay, listen to me. He said, I, I can't bring you to Goldman Sachs dressed like this. Okay, you got to go to Brooks Brothers or J Press. Go buy yourself some like natural fiber clothing." Okay, you, you, I was literally fully flammable for my first <laughs> Goldman Sachs interview. Okay, <laughs> and why am I telling you this? Because it's a rite of passage. You know, you don't go from my neighborhood with my family members. Never hitting a golf ball, never swinging a tennis racket, never seeing the inside of a country club, never seeing the inside of an office building, and it's easy. You know, you go and you have tremors of embarrassment and self-consciousness and doubt as you're trying to find your way and try to try to make that transition. So anyway, you know. That's why I think you guys are dressed like shit. So, so, you know, <laughs> we're not flammable. Maybe you're for yeah, exactly. <laughs> natural fiber. Maybe, no, maybe our hair yeah. products. Yeah, flammable. my hair is definitely no, It's flammable. probably a sign of yeah. intelligence, though, that like I'm dressed like this, all cramped in my suit, ten pounds heavier than I need to be, and you guys are dressed comfortably and casually. It's probably a sign of intelligence. I'm gonna have to put on a suit later. Yeah. You know, when I, if you I go get, on, you, do it. You're gonna go on television. I got, yeah, I got to yeah. do something. I got to so look. That's nice. another big yeah. thing for me. Like. If you're going to be on TV, generations watch television, yeah. young and old. Yeah. And old people like seeing people in suits. Yeah. They, 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 don't, they get turned off by the other stuff. I like looking nice. My, my profile picture on Twitter is still me don't in a conform, suit. Man. Don't just conform. To be, just to be, be you. Just, yeah. Be you. What's going on with the hair, though? I got I mean, it. Honestly, I know you like looking nice, but what is this whole thing with the floof and no, <laughs> with, <laughs> like, spray in there? It's Palo Alto energy. Is that what Big it is? Palo Alto energy. So you, yeah. you, put, you put shit in your head. Nah, and listen, like I that. woke up like this. <laughs> that took, you just woke up like that. If, believe it or not, that's okay. six hundred dollars right there. Is it? Yeah, yeah, six hundred dollars no. to do that. Nah, no, 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 no. you know, uh, I come I from modest means. I, I, uh, I'm impressed. Yeah. I'm impressed. So, so what, I know we're, um, I know low, we're up against the end of time. Low, so. low expectations, yeah. high performance. That'll get you a long way. Yeah. Low expectations. Yeah. So the world doesn't owe you anything. Yeah. Okay, you got to make it happen. Well, yeah, but uh, what I'm hearing you say is also the mentality, you know, your mindset is so, so important. And almost like your mindset is the difference between... 100%. Of course. You know, yeah. I also I think, it. I mean, my biggest takeaway from, from some of the stuff you're saying, too, is you can't do it on your own. Can't I mean, do you it on you your said own. it you as it relates own, to the world's fair. You need fair. help. If you, you know, what did Ben Franklin say? If you want to make a friend, ask a stranger for a favor. Right. Oh, That's yeah. how you make a friend. The beauty is, you know how many times I've done that? Yeah, you I wrote know? about this once. Yeah, okay, yeah. Of course. Yeah. You've got to ask people for, for. Because let me tell you something. Human beings have a nature, good human beings, where they want to reciprocate. Reciprocation is a six continent universal language. If I do you a favor, you are inclined to want to do me one. Yep. And so if I ask you to do me a favor, now you feel good about yourself. And now you know you got an OZ from me. Yeah. You know, and it's not linear. I'm not making it a quid pro quo. You want to do non-linear favors, and you want to be a karma bank yeah. for people. You want people to know they can call you if they're in a pinch, and you're going to be there for them. Yeah. Okay, and you do that, you're going to have a very happy life. And, you know, you wrote about this recently, and I tell my kids, okay, I can only give you two gifts. You want to hear my yes. two things? The only thing you can inherit from me are two things. Forget about the money, because the money's not going to... Make you happy. It would make you comfortable. Two things. Number one, celebrate the successes of your friends. And I've seen you write about that. I can't emphasize that much. You want to be the first call for your friends when something good is happening to them. They're flying themselves into space. Hey, Mooch, I'm flying myself into space. That's awesome. Okay, let's go drink champagne together, right? And then the second thing is find what you really love to do and do that. Don't do anything else. You know what it is. I don't know what it is. I know what it was for me. I like selling. I had a paper route as 11 years old. I love people. I like meeting people. I like connecting people. That's how the Saul Conference came about. I like building businesses that are on teams. I was a, you know, played a lot of team sports as a kid. That's me. That's a manifestation of my professional life as a result of the things that I love. And that's what you have to do in your life. Okay, and you got to relax. Like Mel Brooks says, relax. None of us are getting we out of here relaxed, alive. We don't we? 
You look very relaxed. <laughs> well, but you're not getting out of this thing alive, so you better enjoy that's true. yourself. Drink that's whiskey. True. You know? Yeah. Well, what, for, for what right. it's worth, I, you have definitely embodied those principles in my interactions with you. I'm super excited that we were able to get you in here. And yeah, honestly, really a, excited for what your next mine. act is as well. And, and you, so, you, you took my fashion and Thank haircut so shots pretty well. Okay, yeah. It's a sign that you guys have some personal resilience. Okay. <laughs> Well, appreciate you coming in. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. So in the much. room where it happens, Anthony Scaramucci. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. That was awesome, hey, best man. Of luck Thank you so man. much. I wish you guys Seriously. Was awesome. Great this is great. Success. You're the man. Hell of a discussion, man. Mind blown. Yeah, I lo I love him. Honestly, I know he's gotten a bad rep for some some of the stuff the Trump administration and his experience there, but man, he's a great guy. He dropped and knowledge. Tons of interesting yeah. insights. What were your big takeaways? What was the one big thing you took away from that conversation? A few. I can't. I can't give you one. Well, hit me with your first one. Though. I mean, okay. top of mind is how important it is when you fall down to get back up, and how important that mindset is. And yeah. he talked a lot about that. And I think it's just it's okay to you know we talked about that actually in the beginning with it. You know, some of our me memes, right? Like yeah. falling that you know if you're gonna if you're gonna walk, you're gonna fall. He hit me different with that Super Bowl thing. That was good. Yeah. I never heard you that. You need to be a Super Bowl and you need to be able to bounce off things. I loved that. I, um, you know, for me, the one big takeaway I had was that you just can't do it alone. He referenced it in, in the context of, um, of the World's Fair, actually, like bringing it back to our earlier conversation. If you're going to go and do something really ambitious, you cannot do it alone. And I think that's such a powerful framework for thinking about starting something because the reality with anything, when you're going and doing something big, you just need to have people you can count on. You need to reach out to people, collaborate with different people, et cetera. And so my call to action, like when we think about this community and what we're building, we have all these people that are coming together, all ambitious, all want to learn, all want to go do things. We should collaborate with each other. We should be in the community, talking to each other, interacting. Um, we'll be there to do that alongside you guys. It's an amazing, powerful thing when we can bring each other up, raise each other up, and work together to get shit done. Yeah, and I think uh, the beauty about the internet, like he was talking about the 80s, right? You had to like be physically in a place, right? And now it's just like you don't, you know? Go on your iPhone, hop into the Discord, hop on Twitter, meet people, do good things, and good things will happen to you. And it just compounds. I mean, he talked about the karma thing and just continuing to help people raise other people up and the benefit that that creates for you. And we're creating a platform for that. And what I hope we do with this community is continue to build a place where you can do that, where you can help each other out, where you can look out for one another, where you can support one another, connect someone with someone else. It might not be you that knows the specific thing, but if they have an idea and you know someone that might know something about it, help each other out, connect them. We're happy to do it, reach out to us. But there's something really special here. I'm really glad he said those things. I'm really glad we had the conversation around it. I thought it was a blast. I'm gonna do some good things today. Yeah. That was super fun. Well, cheers, man. Cheers, and, and cheers to you. Cheers to you guys. Right. why do you look so tired? I look so tired because I did not sleep last night. Have you never slept well, or is this a new thing? It's not that I can't fall asleep. I fall asleep, like, right away. But I wake up a couple hours later, and I'm just sitting in my bed, and I look at the ceiling, and I can't fall back asleep. And I don't know what to do. So I was literally you. And for the longest time, I was this like hustle culture bro, sleep when I'm dead, didn't want to sleep, didn't care about my sleep. And then I honestly, I started reading more of the research and realizing how impactful sleep is to your longevity, to your health, all of these other things. And as part of that, I found eight sleep, which has completely revolutionized the way I sleep. I've heard of eight sleep. Can you tell me more about it? Think of it as like the future of sleep. All of these mattress companies have created these mattresses. They're just stock. They're stock mattresses. Eight Sleep is technology plus sleep combined. So the whole product is built around optimizing the temperature that you sleep at. And so you've read about sleeping cold is the key to sleeping. And it's not quite true. Everyone has a different optimal sleep temperature, and it changes throughout the night, which is the crazy part about it. So you might need really cold to fall asleep, and then you might need it to be a little bit warmer to keep you asleep. And the eight sleep actually transitions your temperature through the night to keep you at the optimal sleep, temp sleep temperature at any point during the night. It keeps you asleep. It helps you fall asleep faster. And I actually, since I started using it, have been sleeping better and feeling so much more energized during the day as a result.
Sounds like I need an eight sleep. I think everyone needs an eight sleep. So if you're tuning in right now and you want to try out the eight sleep to completely change the way you sleep, rest, recover so that you're ready to take on all of life's challenges, check out eightsleep.com slash where it happens to get a discount on your first product. Here's a tip. Don't be like Greg Eisenberg. Be like Sahil Bloom. <laughs> Four Sigmatic is the secret sauce behind the Where It Happens podcast. You know how much I've been talking about that hot cocoa, the one that's jam-packed with the reishi mushrooms. It absolutely has been transforming my mornings. I have it at night, completely chills me out, takes out all my stress, and allows me to have a good night's rest. After those long days of tequila on the set, I'm sure that's helpful. I mean, it does help. The sweet vanilla plant-based protein is the one that I've been going to. After my workouts in the mornings, it's been a game changer. 18 grams of plant-based protein, adaptogens, jam-packed with mushroom goodness, it's been a complete game changer for me. So to go check it out, go to foursigmatic.com and use code THEROOM at checkout. Join our free community at trwih.com.